clean the children, ungrateful, unholy. Uh, it talks about the dead feelings, not having really the right feelings. It talks about being truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent. That means being without constraint. What used to be done in secret is now done in the open. I was reading a newspaper the other day, and they just had a gay march here in our own city of McAllen. Did y'all have any idea they had a gay march down the streets of McAllen? They have a great, they have gay rights. They have, uh, now Obama just recently said that he's giving rights to gays. Now that if two men or two women get married, if one has a good job, the other one can now get benefits in some states. It used to only be a couple states. He's passing all these laws towards this stuff. These are things that we're talking about. Things that were done in secretly are now done in the open. That's what we mean on television shows. When you turn on the TV, those same things that were done in secret, now you see them on the television. All you got to do is turn your TV on, and you can see all these things being done in the open. That's being uncontinent, not having any kind of control. It talks about also being intolerant, being fierce, disdain of people, despisers of those that are good, traitor, high on it. You know, it's not unusual to go into an average church today and see even in a youth group to see one other kid who claims to be a Christian making fun of another Christian who's living for God. That's not unusual today because God says that'll be the sign of the time. Where I never thought I'd see the day where one Christian, so-called Christian, will make fun of another Christian because of their standards, because they choose to have a higher standard to live for God. I never thought I'd see that day, but the Bible says it'll be a day, and we're in that day today. We see lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That means simply this, have a form, form of outward resemblance to God, but the godliness is being reverent and devout. In other words, having an outward, so it's kind of like having like a priest. You're, you're arranging the garment, and when you walk into a place of business, everybody recognizes you're a priest because they see your collar. But in your heart, you don't know God. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That's how he described the Pharisees. So as we move down, we'll see this. Look at verse 14, if you're in your Bible. 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. Here we see that Paul begins to challenge him. This is where I want to spend my time. He says this. He says, Timothy, the world is getting worse and worse. So what I want you to do is I want you to continue in the things that you've learned. I want you to continue in the Word of God. That's what he says here. In other words, he's saying this. The world is like an ocean or a sea that we're all in that ocean. And we're all in boats or however we want to float on top of water. And what's happening is, is there's a wind that comes across that water and everybody's kind of drifting in one direction. But what the Bible does for the Christian, as the world gets worse and worse, the Bible's an anchor for our soul. It's like lowering the anchor down that water and as the wind's blowing, we stay in the same spot as the world gets worse and worse. And what he's saying to Timothy is this Bible's an anchor for our lives. Continue in the Word of God. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change, folks, regardless of what this world does. Look at verse 14. We see here, the Bible says here, we see the first point, make a personal, I want you to write this down, make a personal commitment to continue in the things you have learned. Let me say it again. Make a personal commitment to continue in the things that you have learned. In other words, this decision does not depend on what someone else is doing. It depends on your own personal decision. Look at verse 14. It says this. But, that, but continue thou. What does that word thou mean? You. It's you. It's a personal thing. Paul is telling Timothy personally. He says, I'm not asking you, Timothy, to look at what the world is doing. He says, I'm telling you personally that you need to continue. He says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast what? Learned. So here we see a personal challenge to continue. That word continue doesn't, is not in terms of what we think to continue, but it actually means to abide or dwell. This is simply what it means. It means to actually stay in or abide in the Word of God, to live in the Scriptures. That's what it means to continue. It doesn't mean to go forth necessarily, but it means to continue in the Scriptures and everything God wants to do will happen in your life. Okay, This word is actually used over 100 times in the New Testament, and it's used over 50 times by John himself, we find in the Bible. So Timothy was to abide or to make himself at home in the Word of God. That's what it means. It was a safe haven for his life. I don't know about you, but I have problems in my life sometimes. But when I go to the Word of God, it's a safe haven. It's promises of the Word of God. I can go there and know. Did you know that by the age of 18, you've already lived 25% of your life based on the national average? That means that once you graduate, you've already lived 25% of your life. You know what that time is for? For you to prepare for the rest of your life, for the other 75% of your life. That's exactly what it's for. But what does the average young person do? They go, well, I'll have a little fun over here and do all my things, and then when I get older, then I'll live for God. No, you've already messed up. Remember what I said last week when that guy says, man, I wish I knew the Bible the way you did. And he said this, it's too late. You should be studying every day of your life. It's too late. You don't ever want to get to a point in your life where God tells you it's too late. You don't ever want to be there. And so we find here that as we look at this, we'll see 
that when you graduate, it's not a time for you just to go off and do your thing, but it's where you take everything you've learned and now you begin to apply those things in your life because now you are fully accountable for everything that you do. So these are principles by which you must live, plans that must be fulfilled, and purposes that must be carried out. God died for you personally, and I believe with all my heart he has a personal plan for your life. Think about that for a moment. If you were the only person on the face of the earth, God would have still died for you personally. That tells me he has a personal plan for your life. That's why he died for you. He purchased you and set you apart so that he might do something through your life individually. That's what God wants to do. So not only do we see a personal challenge, but number two, we see a particular challenge. He says, continue thou, but then he says this, in the things that you have learned. He was very specific in that. The things that are in the word of God. Continue in those things. We, here we see a challenge to continue or remain in what the Bible teaches. I, I want to read Daniel 1.8. Many of y'all know the scripture. It says this. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not, what? Defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. Now, I want you to look at these personal pronouns. Usually when we use personal pronouns, it's a selfish way, but it's a good way to use them in a bad way. He uses it in a good way. Let me explain what I mean. He says here, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So what did he do? He purposed in his heart that he will live according to the word of God. That's simply what he did. In other words, he said this, I don't care what the world is doing. I'm now captured. I'm in captivity. I'm in Babylon High. But when I get there, I'm going to continue what I learned over here when I get over there. He said, I'm going to purpose in my heart to do that. And it simply means this. If you don't make a purpose in your life to live for God, and that's not the reason why you exist, and you don't seek to do His will, you're going to automatically fall. There's no other way to live. You're setting yourself up for Satan. It's a trap. If you haven't dedicated your complete life to Jesus Christ, you're going to fall. That's the bottom line. Because you're not dedicated to that life, the Christian life. He did not just make a decision, but a purpose. A decision is but for a moment, but a purpose is for eternity. Mm. It's for eternity. When you make that decision, you're saying, God, to, unless you take me from this earth, I'm going to continue to serve you out into eternity. There's a seamless life. You don't live one way in the church, live a different way in the world, but that's a continuation up into eternity. That's why it says that we want to be able to stand before the Lord and Him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what that means. It's a seamless life. He was tested ten days. He was tempted with delights. He was taunted about his devotion. He was trapped in a den. But we find in verse 21, the Bible says this about Daniel. And Daniel continued even into the first year of King Cyrus. Even though he went through all those things, the Bible said in verse 21, he continued. That's what we want to believe and know about Daniel. He continued. I think about Joseph. He was a faithful son. He was a faithful brother. Do you know that in the Bible, the Bible says that even though he knew his brothers did not like him, when his brothers went out to work and didn't return home, his father sent him to go look for his brothers. And Joseph could have done this. He could have went out and said, oh, okay. I guess I don't see him, so I'll go home. He didn't do that. The Bible says he searched everywhere looking for them. Even though he knew his brothers did not like him, they despised him, he was faithful to his father. He was a great son. He was a great brother. He was also a great servant. The Bible says he was one of the best servants, that so much so that he was so faithful to Potiphar. He was even a great prisoner. And then what did God do with his life? He saved much people alive. Because of his faithfulness. That's what he did. The Bible says this about Joseph when he was in Potiphar's house. When his wife began, began to come after me. It says this in verse 8. But he refused. And then verse 9 it says this. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. Because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He, was he selfish? No. He was selfless. That's what I mean. The first sin we saw was being selfish. You've got to be the complete opposite. Be selfless. That's what God can do. He was able to use Joseph. You know, Joseph had every excuse in the Bible not to live for God, didn't he? I mean, he grew up in a poor family situation. His family hated him. Probably some people in the world hated him because he was so godly. But yet, look what God did with his life. All I'm saying is there are going to be some sacrifices we're going to have to make. But boy, oh boy, don't they pay off. Do you think that when I first got became was saved as a Christian, if I could look into the future and see my life now, I'm so glad to say I can look back in my life and realize I have no regrets for living the Christian life the way I did. God will come through in your life when you're faithful to him. He just will. I think about David. He was a faithful shepherd. Anybody know the two things that David killed as a shepherd? What did the Bible say he killed? A lion. A lion and what? Bear. Now, if you were a shepherd, you think you can kill a lion and a bear? I don't think so. I know you think you can, church. church. He's got his hand up. His eyes are big. So he said, 
<laughs> he really think he, and he believes he can do it too. We were wrestling the other day, and he was, you know, I'm not letting him in, but he got on top and he kind of threw his little weight around and kind of pinned me down. Like, oh, son, let me up, let me up. He had a good old time. Now he's going to tell you about he beat daddy. I'm going to get him tonight. Yeah. Yeah. So we find here that David was also faithful. We also know that he was a good brother also. He was a good faithful brother because when the brothers were at battle and that big old giant was running his trap, what did David do for his brother? Anybody remember? He took him what? He took him food. Amen? He was a good brother. He was also faithful uh, as a friend. Who was he a great friend to? Jonathan. He was a great friend to Jonathan. King Saul, Jonathan's father, wanted to kill his life, but yet he still befriended Jonathan because he saw Jonathan's character, regardless of who his father was. So he was a great friend. So what am I saying? That God used him to lead God's people. He was faithful and God used him. That's a, it's real simple. That's all I'm saying. Be faithful and God will use you. If you're not faithful, he won't use it. Y'all get that, right? It's real simple. That's what I'm trying to say tonight. If you just hold on there. Now look at Titus 1 and 9. It says this. You don't need to turn there. But we talk about the word continue. It word, the word means, it says holding fast. That means hold firmly the faithful word as he hath been taught. Continue thou in the things that thou hast what? Learned. That's what we've been talking about here. So it is completely reliable and worthy of trust. We must not only know it, but we must allow it to guard and direct and guide our lives. That's so important. You know, many of y'all have, how many of y'all knew about, I mean, you were pretty young when this happened, this happened back in 1999, but JFK Jr., okay, the, the, the son of who? JFK, right? Okay. Well, he had a pilot's license, but it was only one problem. He was not regulated to fly a plane by instrumentation only. In other words, he was not one of those pilots that can fly in the dark or without having sight. He was only qualified to fly a plane by having sight when he could see and on that day, it was clear. He went out. He had his wife and he had his, his sister-in-law in the plane. And he went out that day. He was flying around. He was just going from one location to another. It would be pretty cool to have your own plane, right? And so he was flying this plane, and all of a sudden, the sky got dark, and he couldn't see. And so he began to kind of go by his feelings. So picture this. You're in a plane, or you're flying, and you, you, you kind of got this, this, this balance. You got this, uh, this thing called the... Uh, uh, Medela, uh, you know, all that stuff in there. You've got your pituitary glands and all that stuff. And it gives you a sense of balance. And so he's flying this thing. He's going by his feelings and, and all these things. And then he begins to try to land the plane. And instead of landing the plane on the, the runway, he, he nose dives this thing and lands right in the side of that, that, that embankment and he kills everybody in the plane. See, the instruments of that plane is like the Word of God. And if you don't know the Word of God, and you don't live according to the Word of God, you're going to crash. If you trust your feelings like he did, you can ruin your life. That's the moral of the story. And so the Word of God is our instruments and in how we guide ourselves. Like it's not our emotions and feelings. Don't ever make a decision based on your emotions and feelings because you're going to crash. We need to make sure it's based on the Word of God. And that's why Timothy said, no matter what you do, Timothy, when God takes me home, I want you to continue in the things that thou hast learned. That's how vital it is for your life. That's what we're talking about tonight. Number two, you need to make a personal commitment to the things that are certain. He says, continue to endow the things that thou have learned. And then he says this, and has been assured of. Well, what does he mean by being assured of? Well, he means this. First of all, I'm going to give you three things. Write it down on point two. The Bible is a sure wisdom of salvation. First of all, we see that it gives you a proper foundation. Look at verse 15. The very next verse under 14 is verse 15. It says this. It says, And that from a child thou hast what? Known. known the Holy Scriptures. We talk about a proper foundation. You see, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. My parents played little Bible stories with me, but it wasn't like my kids where they get to hear the Bible every day. And sometimes two or three or four times a day they hear the Bible. I did not grow up, grew up in that situation. But the Bible says, Timothy, he says, From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. I think of Jesus Christ, how he was being obedient. The Bible said he was submissive to his parents, and how after the, after the feast was over, he stayed in the temple for three days, and he was talking to doctors and lawyers. And he began to inquire of them. He continued in the house of God. He loved being in the house of God. I see that there. And how from a child he knew the word of God, and how he was raised up and served his healthy father. He was completely submitted to his will. We see here, remember the impact the Bible had on your life. If you're here tonight and you're truly saved, the Bible has had to have some type of impact in your life. Don't ever forget that. The impact that the Word of God has had in your life. I wouldn't be here tonight 
if it wasn't for the impact of the Word of God on my life. I thank God for that day. I came into a room about this size. There were 25 college students in there. I sat down on that, on that chair, and a little man from Iraq began to preach from the Bible and began to talk about heaven and hell, and God got a hold of my heart. If it wasn't for the Word of God, I wouldn't be here today, folks. Amen. I don't tell the world.